It's a year since we halted the silent marches. We're very aware today on this Mother's Day of the people that we lost. We're also aware that there's a lot of information that's coming out of the inquiry. Kate Lamble gives a broad spectrum view of what is coming out of the inquiry at the moment and what is coming next. So my name's Kate Lamble and I'm the producer and currently the presenter of the BBC's Grenfell Tower Inquiry podcast. So essentially when the public inquiry into the Grenfell Tower fire started, the BBC knew that it was going to be this big, long, complicated story that would often fall in and out of the headlines and they wanted to be a way where we could keep following it over this long period of time. And the answer was the Grenfell Tower Inquiry podcast. So we've been running since the first day of the inquiry all the way back in May 2018. We initially covered it daily during phase one and at the moment it, there's a weekly episode talking about what's happened at the inquiry and covering the evidence, sometimes with interviews to help putting it into context. Uh, and that's up on BBC Sounds and wherever you get your podcasts and it will be forever. So phase one of the inquiry, which took place in 2018, was all about what happened on the night of the fire. And phase two is about why it happened. And the reason the inquiry has done this is for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's because they thought that the recommendations they might have about how the firefighters acted on the night might have short term implications to save lives. Essentially, they wanted to bring those recommendations in first. And the second point is that it helps us understand what was important on the night of the fire. So why waste time listening to a lot of evidence about something if it didn't impact the night? So doing it this way means that we can understand what impact something has and then investigate how that material got put onto the tower, what testing it went through, what decisions were behind it. So phase two is all about the decisions that happened to create the situation on the night of the Grenfell Tower fire. And so first in phase two, we heard about those involved in the refurbishment of the tower, the designers, the architects, the contractors that put the material on. And then there's currently, what we're currently in is module two, and essentially that's looking at the testing and the certification behind the materials that were installed. And so that's looking at the manufacturers, people like Celotex and Kingspan who made the insulation, and Arconic who made the cladding panels, and looking at what tests they put their materials through and how they advertise them as materials for them to be bought and then later installed. Installed. And so we've got this insight over module two in this complicated web of ways that manufacturers could get their materials um, approved for use on a tower. And we found that each of those three main companies, Celotex, Kingspan and Arconic, they have big questions about how they certified and approved their materials for use. So Celotex, we know that they needed to get their combustible insulation approved through something called a large scale fire test. And essentially you build a big cladding system, everything that would normally be installed in a bit building, you set it on fire. If it passes, the entire system gets approved for use on a building. Celotex's insulation got approved through one of these tests, but actually what we found out through the inquiry is that they used an extra board, something called magnesium oxide, which is sometimes used to line furnaces. It's that non-combustible. And after using this board, this, it wasn't mentioned in either the test report or Celotex's later marketing material. Kingspan were another manufacturer who helped, uh, whose insulation was installed on Grenfell Tower. And we know that they used a test from 2005 to sell their material all the way up until 2020. The problem was they changed the way they produced their product, they manufactured their product in 2006. And all the tests on the new formulation of the product failed since then. It's been described as, one of the tests has been described as having turned into a raging inferno. So actually, they advertised their new formulation of their product using an old test on the material for 14 years until that test was withdrawn in October 2020. Arconic made the cladding panels and we've heard that they had a certificate from somebody called the British Board of Agamont that said that their panels were class naught, which is essentially the standard that they were meant to be to be used on a high rise building. Only the testing behind that was only on a fire retardant version of the panel, not the polyethylene filled combustible panels that were installed on Grenfell Tower. That same certificate said that they achieved European class B only that was only for the flat riveted panels, not the bent and shaped cassette version that was later installed on Grenfell Tower. Those panels had only achieved a class E or a class F, and yet that wasn't revealed to people buying this material. Phase two of the inquiry has been running since January 2020. So we're a good way in now. And I think it's fair to say that we haven't heard from a single witness who did a good job from beginning to end. 
So that's everyone from the architects and the specialist cladding company who did the designs for the tower, who didn't design cavity barriers around the outside of the windows. And we know that the one of the main routes that the fire spread first out of and back into the tower was through the gaps at the end edge of, of the windows and the series of materials which allowed the fire to progress in that way all the way through to the installers who we know installed cavity barriers upside down the wrong way round and cut with gaps on the edge of it and who also packed combustible insulation around the edges of these windows in places where we know that non-combustible insulation was specified so there's a series of decisions made by lots and lots of companies that got us to this point one of them, which is the type of cladding panel that was used on the tower. So I mentioned that the flat riveted panel sold by Arconic was a class B. And that's because essentially it was a flat panel riveted onto the edge. And when it was on fire, the polyethylene, the combustible material inside, on, uh, covered on either side by aluminium, melted and dripped away from the inside of it. Because what was selected for Grenfell Tower was a cassette panel, essentially you just bend the edges around at the top and bottom so it looks like at the front and sides of an old fashioned cassette, that combustible material didn't drain away. It pooled on the lip on the inside and it remained there until it got hot enough to ignite. And so that increased the combustibility. So we've got hundreds of decisions made by lots of different companies and lots and lots of different individuals, all of which contributed to the events of the night. So, Within the Inquiries Act, which is essentially what lays out how public inquiries in the UK are run, there is a right for you not to self-incriminate during your oral evidence. And so at the beginning of phase two, there was a lot of concern that many of the witnesses would call upon this right to help them refuse to answer questions. They'd say, I can't answer that because that would involve self-incrimination. And the concern was that this would happen so often that it would disrupt proceedings. And so what happened was they called upon the Attorney General to make a blanket agreement that no one would have their oral evidence used against them in future criminal or civil prosecutions. And so what they came up with is essentially this agreement, which means that if I say, if I'm giving evidence and I say, I did it, you can't use that against me in future prosecutions. But if there's a document that says I did it, you could use that against me in future prosecutions. And importantly, if I say someone else did it, you can use that against them in future prosecutions. It's hard to know how this has really affected evidence. We certainly know that there haven't been any witnesses who've refused to answer questions on the basis of self-incrimination. How this will affect future prosecutions is a difficult thing to say, and there are lots of different theories about what that might be. So some people think it might be quite harmful uh, because you can't use this evidence, but some people actually think it might be quite helpful to the police to have everything laid out in public that they know what's happened and that they can then use that to their advantage. We have to remember that a lot of these witnesses have also given separate interviews to the Metropolitan Police, which can be used against them in future prosecutions. No one is going to be immune from prosecution. There's just limitations about the oral evidence that's being given in the inquiry itself. So, Module three in phase two of the inquiry is all about the residents and their relationship with the tenant management organisation which ran the building and the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. So there's going to be a lot of questions about the complaints that residents made to the TMO and the RBKC in the lead up to the Grenfell Tower fire and what their response was. Um, there's going to be lots of questions about the TMO's responsibility in terms of things like fire doors. So we know that door, front doors of buildings and doors into stairwells were meant to automatically close. And yet on the night of the fire, we know that many of them didn't, allowing smoke to spread throughout the building, which affected people's ability to escape. That, a lot of that was the responsibility of the tenant management organisation. So there's going to be lots of questions about their responsibility in respect to those issues, as well as complaints. So I think one of the really important things that we have coming up is this period in October to December when the government are going to be giving evidence. And a lot of this, you know, we've heard throughout phase two is about the regulations that people were meant to follow and whether they followed those regulations or not. But actually how those regulations were set, who set them and how tight they were is the responsibility of government. And so it's gonna be very interesting hearing their explanations for why there were multiple ways in which combustible materials could be approved for use on high rise buildings. Um, and the warnings that they received and listened to or didn't listen to, and the discussions of how those decisions were made is gonna be a very interesting one to be had towards the end of 2021. I think the issue with Grenfell is having that cut through. What we're getting at the inquiry 
is an incredibly complicated picture through hundreds of witnesses and thousands of documents and it all adding up into this incredibly complicated picture of how the construction industry works. And so when we hear about it in the news on the six o'clock news or the 10 o'clock news, it tends to be these things where there's been cut through. So basically we're iconic and there's an issue with the cladding or there's an issue with the insulation. But I think what's fascinating is this complicated web of how the construction industry works the responsibility that each of them think the other companies are taking and the presumption or the assumption that somebody else will be taking care of that. Oh, well, that's the designer's responsibility. Oh, well, I presume the manufacturers are going to do that. And I think actually what's fascinating here and what we're getting a picture of is the construction industry as a whole, not just these individual stories. Um, it's quite hard to communicate that, but I think certainly the construction industry needs to take lessons from that as well as individual stories of single tests that there were an issue with. So the recommendations from phase one came out in October 2019 and a year on we calculated that about four of the 46 recommendations had been implemented in their entirety. There are some more that are going through Parliament at the moment and that are going to be put into place with various constrictions on them. But in full, it was about four out of 46. If we think that it's, um, it took about a year for the phase one recommendations to be put into place, phase two isn't meant to finish hearing evidence until February 2022. It, we're unlikely to get the report until perhaps 2023. And so the length of times that, the sort of the time that it will take us to know what those recommendations are, let alone whether they will be put into place and the response from the government, going to be a considerable period of time. And there's wider questions, not just about specific recommendations that come from this, but about whether there's a culture change within the construction industry as well. Justice. 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 Thank you for your continued support. Good night and God bless every single one of you. Thank you.